Good afternoon, good evening, where you all are calling in from. As everybody joins, we're gonna give people a couple minutes to just log in and get settled. But if you can find the bottom of your screen, there's the Q&A section there and the button, if you can click that and tell us where you are calling in from or watching in from today. And if some of you guys are watching us and probably some of you are listening. So find that Q&A section and let us know where you're calling from. New Zealand. Alyssa, oh, you got people. I was going to say, I was yeah. going to, yeah, New Zealand. Great. What, Las Vegas, what time it is there? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 12 hours different, yeah. whatever. You must Very be far morning. different than we are. Oh, morning time. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vegas, Canada. I've got North Carolina, California, Colorado, UK, France. Wow, guys, we're really excited to have such an international crowd on this call today. And it really speaks to um, the vision that we are looking at, right, of sustainability and, and protecting our environment, but creating an opportunity to spread opportunity across the globe. So really excited to see so many people calling in from so many different places, Mexico, Nigeria, Canada, Colorado again. Yes, very exciting. Oh, 9.01 a.m. on Thursday is our New Zealand ah, going in. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Mike. Nice. Yeah. Virginia. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So take a seat, take a glass of water, and listen, we've got a really exciting opportunity for you all today. Good. Melissa, thank you very much. Uh, wow, that, that is quite a, a, a cast of, uh, of folks here from all over the world, which, which is really neat. And, and that's, that's one of the things we've that's one of the reasons we ask the question, and and yeah, sometimes it's a much smaller grouping of folks. But today, goodness, it really, probably every continent, maybe except for Antarctica, right? Anyway, very very cool. Um, so it is, uh, it's uh, it's a it's a great day. I've got some great news at the end of the presentation that we'll share with you uh, about the sawmill investment. But I'd like to introduce uh, Ryan Palmer, who's with us today. Uh, Ryan is in Panama. He. He started with us uh, just a little over a year ago, last August, so I guess 13 months, and he and his family moved to Panama. They have been on the ground, boots on the ground, getting the job done day in, day out, uh, uh, helping to manage the existing plantations that we have, but primarily focused on the uh, startup of our sawmill. And so we're going to talk about a couple things today. We're going to go through uh, the teak plantation uh, because that really gives a lot of background on teak and and why you might want to own a piece of the sawmill. Uh, we do talk about the investment opportunity in the long-term teak ownership, which is a 25-year time frame. Uh, but then we get to the sawmill investment as well, which I think was uh, one of the reasons folks may be joining us today. I try to keep the presentation to about 30, 35 minutes. We'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, Alyssa will be looking for those questions. She'll consolidate questions because a lot of times similar questions come in. Uh, but one thing I will promise you is that no matter what question you ask, um, if we don't get to it today, uh, somebody will follow up and provide an answer to those questions. Alyssa will make sure that happens for you. So I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share, Alyssa. Just let me know that uh, uh, that it's up and visual, please. Yep, we got you Mike. All right, full screen? Full screen. All right, terrific. Well, very good. So we'll jump into it here now. And, and again, about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. And Ryan's got some great news for us as well. So, all right. You know, I, I think many of you have become familiar with Teak as an investment product over the last few years. Certainly, we've been talking a lot about it. And, uh, and, and there are some really, really good reasons why. But before we get into Teak specifically, what I would like to do is just give a very general background you know, our development company, of which I'm the CEO, uh, we started our company in 1996 in the country of Belize. We now have property and operations in uh, six countries, uh, and we're expanding. And so we've been doing this a long time, and we're very, very good at what we do. And the reason we're really good at what we do is because we have great people. And I always like to just highlight and show some of the folks in our leadership team, because these are the folks that are getting it done day in, day out, uh, and, and also uh, the ones that you can count on for uh, the results. Uh, you know, timber itself, in this case, teak timber, 
uh, is a very, very nice investment as a standalone investment. It's also something that's very affordable. Uh, on the right side, a newborn teak, baby teak, we call it. It could be it could be to be planted. It could be just planted teak. But it's basically newborn teak, age zero, uh, for less than $7,000, $6,000. 880. So it's an investment that almost anybody can make, right? If you've got $7,000 and you want to put it to work, uh, you know, baby teak is an easy way to do it. Uh, we're almost out of our teenage teak. We were able to secure uh, somebody else's plantation that had been very well maintained. In fact, I just rode it a couple of weeks ago with Ryan on horseback. Uh, and and so the teenage teak is a little closer to harvest. It's about seven, eight years to harvest as opposed to 25 and then our mature plantation is at this point sold out. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, uh, it also comes with the ability to get residency, which for some people is really important, a plan B, so to speak, uh, that you have this idea that you can actually, you know, you can get the teak, you can own the investment, but that investment qualifies you for a residency. Uh, this happens to be the residency in Nicaragua. Uh, there's also a residency process in Panama that's available as well. You know, a lot of people are looking at at you know alternative investments. We're we're seeing what happens in the you know in the U.S., Canadian, European governments probably happening over in New Zealand too. I'm not exactly sure there, but you know most governments today are you know they're just out of control. They're spending money, uh, or as I like to say, they're you know they're printing money and spending money like drunken sailors, right? And and we all really understand this is not sustainable in the long run. Uh, you know that 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 rooster has to come home and. And we're already seeing it in things like purchasing power, inflation, you know, purchasing power of the dollars, the euros way down. Uh, assets, hard assets like gold and Bitcoin have done very, very well. And so what we're really talking about today uh, with the teak specifically, but also the commodity, which is important for the sawmill, teak lumber, right, has just done incredibly well uh, over the long, long term. And we're going to talk more about what that long term is in a minute. But if you invested $10,000 in 1971, uh, that, 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 that investment in just a standard teak or a timber investment would be worth about $1.5 million. And the, the IRRs, the ROIs are, are incredible uh, over the long term. So timber as an asset class has done very, very well. And if you look at here at the top line in that chart, what you'll also see is that, again, it's done very, very well over long periods of time, but it does not have the volatility that things like the stock market have. Again, it's a commodity. Uh, it's got very, very good long-term track record without the volatility. So again, this is the idea. You can make an investment, you can get the investment itself, but you can also obtain the residency. And it's actually something that you can do today, right? It's it's under $7,000. So in terms of small investments that have a very large payout outside the traditional asset base, it's a hard asset outside your home country unless you live in Panama or Nicaragua, right? So you, you're diversifying your asset class into a hard asset. You're diversifying geographically into a new country outside your home country. So Owning teak timber is something that many, many people have decided to do. And we're going to look at some of the reasons with diversification, both from an asset class and geography, the earnings. Uh, we'll talk more about that. The security legacy. Wow, legacy. We're, we're going to spend a few minutes later and talk about that. And then this idea of a plan B. And we're, we're not going to spend any more time on that today. But for many of you who are concerned about what's happening politically, socially, economically, uh, some of the challenges facing you know, many societies around the world, having a plan B, having a place that you could go and live outside your home country, if it ever came to that, goodness, we hope it never happens, right? We don't, we don't buy health insurance hoping to get the, every last penny of value out of it, right? We buy the health insurance hoping we never need it, right? But if we do need it, we're really, really glad we have it. And that's what a plan B is, a residency overseas outside your home country. Antique ownership in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, will qualify you for that residency. Uh, so let's talk about the financial reasons. Three great reasons, but financial reasons you really should own teak. Well, it's limited in supply and it's becoming more and more limited all the time. Harvest rates are eight to 10 times faster than any replanting. And if we just look at the simple laws of supply and demand, demand goes up, supply goes down. What generally happens to price? 
You know, the idea of giving back to mother nature, right? I mean, the, the, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting down forests at an alarming rate. And so anything we can do to put trees back in the ground is a wonderful thing as stewards of the earth. Uh, uh, and it's just statistics on, on how quickly the forests are being uh, destroyed and, 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 and illegally logged too, by the way. Uh, the demand is up. Global demand is up. It continues to go up. And we see that because the average price of teak has gone up 5.5% a year over the last 51 years. Prices only go up when something is in demand. Again, supply and demand. Uh, and global supply is down. Uh, here's the chart. Uh, since 1972, I guess that's 52 years now, the median wholesale price of teak has increased 5.5% a year over 52 years. That is an incredible track record. And what we're seeing in the bottom chart is that green line is the value of natural teak in the jungle. The red line is the value of teak that's plantation grown. And somewhere around 2008, 2009, those intersect. And the value of plantation teak, because all the major uh, uh, stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, the Canadian version, the European version, all the, the big major consumers of teak demand that it be uh, sustainable uh, uh, forestry stewardship council fsc certified so so the value of the plantation teak has gone way way up and the value of the legal logs uh, is continuing to go down so again doing something right actually pays off again we talked about the price of teak because of supply and demand and then this idea of above average returns with uh, you know really a much safer investment, certainly less volatile. You know, and Steve Sugarroot, a friend of mine for goodness, about 30 years now, you know, trees grow through the recessions, they grow through wars, they grow through stock market crashes, they grow through everything. They give you the built-in investment growth that isn't guaranteed with the stock, right? Because back in 2008 to 2012, one of the worst times in the real estate industry uh, in, in 50 years in the US and a very bad time for the markets as well, our trees just simply kept growing year after year. The trees themselves kept growing. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about a timber investment. You know, trees don't care what's happening in the economy. They just simply keep growing. And one of the things that's been really, really challenging, I think, for a lot of people who want to invest in an asset class like timber is how do you get into it? Right? How do you get into timber? Like, if you're one of these rich guys, Malone or or uh, 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 Ted Turner, right? And you you've got you know tens or hundreds or you know hundreds of millions of dollars or even into the billions these days, right? You know, if you want to go buy fifty thousand acres and have somebody plant trees for you, no problem, you can do it, right? But if, but if you have got seven thousand dollars or or fifteen or twenty or thirty thousand dollars, how do you get involved in timber? Right? It's not something that's an easily accessible asset class. But we, we have made that possible. We've done that. Uh, back in 1998, I started looking for land in Panama in 1999. We hired a forestry company. We bought the land, about 100 acres. We hired a forestry company to plant the, uh, the plantation. And that's our mature plantation, which we were then able to chop up into smaller pieces, about a quarter of an acre, one-tenth of a hectare, technically and specifically. Uh, and and be able to offer these for folks who want to have timber as an asset class. And these are some of the folks that have gone out to talk to their trees or sing to their trees or do whatever they want. It's it, it's wonderful. And, you know, one of the biggest uh, 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 concerns that we get from folks is 25 years. My goodness, 25 years. Like, that's crazy. I can't wait 25 years. But you know what? Back in 1998, 1999, when we were looking for the land and then planting the land, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I said, you know, 25 years, you know, is going to come whether, you know, I might not be around and we hope we'll be around in 25 years, but maybe I will, maybe I won't. But the investment is an investment for children, for grandchildren and, and having something that, that matures on a, on a generational basis, once every 25 years, generations about 20 years, right? So about 20, 25 years. So you build a legacy of generational wealth stewardship with a timber investment, and I like the next slide because the next slide shows some pretty old guys, right? I don't know, they're probably in their 70s, maybe 80s, and they're still making 20, 25, 30 year investments, right? 
because you know what? They have enough money. They, they, they're, they, don't, they don't need the money right now. But what they're doing is they're stewarding the wealth into future generations for their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, charitable foundations, universities that they want to leave uh, money to, great causes, right? So they understand the power of compounding over many decades, right? 20, 30 years, that, that IRR compounding is so big. So these are guys who are already way up in age, and they continue to make investments that push the 20, 30-year mark. Um, you, you should be too. Uh, teak as an asset uh, is uh, used in furniture, fine furniture. I had a Rondack chair for you know 800 bucks, right? Um, because it's made out of teak. The qualities of teak make it a great outdoor furniture wood. Uh, it also, I mean, a bath mat for 250, right? I mean, these are just some of the incredible prices. Same stuff made out of, you know, other hardwoods would be, you know, a quarter of those kind of numbers. Uh, the shipbuilding industry is really where Teak got its name. Everybody from the Chinese, you know, a thousand years ago and the Indians, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, building boats out of teak because it's impervious to rot. It makes for a great marine lumber. Uh, it's very, very hard. It's very, very durable. Um, and so it became a very important asset uh, for the Indians and the Chinese. And it still is. It's still used in fine uh, uh, watercraft like the the Chris craft and other yachts and things like that. Um, but it's also something that shows status. Uh, and, and in India and China, that's particularly important. And as both of those countries continue to uh, gain more population, but their populations are, are moving towards middle class and upper class, the idea of status is really important. Uh, the growth of those populations and the growth of the teak consumption in India and China have been incredible drivers of the value and the consumption of teak over the last 50 years. Uh, you know, and again, teak flooring in you know forty-five million dollar uh, uh, apartments in New York City, right? Uh, so again, just the use in outdoor furniture, uh, location selection really important. Uh, we selected the eastern side of Panama, the Darien province, for our uh, uh, our our teak plantation. But we also selected this site for our sawmill, and so I'm going to segue into sawmill for a second, and I'm going to segue back out. Uh, you know, this is where the Darien province there on the right picture, the the the, the green square. Uh, this is where much, my, most of the teak in Panama is grown. And we'll talk about why that in a second. Uh, but because that's where the teak is grown, uh, it's where we also will be locating our sawmill to really take advantage of the, the specific location of taking, you know, trees to logs to lumber all in one location. Very, very important. Uh, the optimal location, the Darien province of Panama, really is an optimal location. It's got something that's critically important for high-quality teak. High-quality teak is, is produced when the area that it's grown in has a, a very specific dry season, three to five months with no rain, none. And that's what cures the wood and gives it the hardness quality that makes teak so, so valuable. Uh, soft teak is still valuable. Uh, hard teak is far more valuable. And so that dry season is critically important. Obviously, the fertility, the, you know, the well draining, uh, elevation is important, rainfall is important, temperature is important. Uh, but the single biggest factor is this dry season to cure the wood to produce the highest quality teak. Now, back in 1998, I didn't know anything about teak. Pretty much I'd heard of it, and that was about it. So, you know, started looking for land in in Panama, and in 1999, we we purchased the land. Uh, but it, you know, at the same time, we were also interviewing forestry companies because, again, I didn't know what I didn't know anything about teak. Um, but what I did know is that there were companies in Panama that grew teak for people. Uh, that was what they did: professional teak forestry companies. And so we went out and we found one. The, the company we ultimately selected was a company called Heo Forestal, a guy by the name of Jacobo Melamed young forestry engineer, took me to the seedling nurseries, took me all over. We looked at property together, took me to plantations that were existing. Um, he is now the general manager of the business 25 years later, which is actually really cool. And they they now manage uh, four plantations in Panama for us. You know, the old Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton song, you, you can't make old friends, right? I mean, here's a guy that, you know, we stomped around Panama together, had some fun, adventurous stories. If you ever come down to Panama on one of our discovery tours, I'll share some of those with you. Needless to say, 
you know, out at the end of the Pan American Highway back in 1998 and 1999 was, it was way out there and we were way out there looking for property and visiting plantations. And, you know, Jacobo and I, you know, we did all that together. And, you know, now he's the general manager of this business part owner. So, you know, th th those are the things that really matter that long term. And back at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about being in the region for, you know, for 28 years. Uh, those long-term relationships really, really matter. So this is uh, Teak Seedlings. Uh, we we had seedlings uh, being prepared for us in 1998 ahead of purchasing the property. Then in 1999, we uh, we bought the property. It was a cattle pasture. Uh, they they basically just cut the brush and they planted, uh, I guess, let me think, uh, 40 hectares, 44,000 uh, teak trees, um, 1,100 teak trees per hectare. Uh, and so when, when you look at the value of teak, uh, we, we, we measure it two ways. We, we always look at, you know, average growth, average quality. That's important. Average growth, average quality for Panama. And we, and we look at two factors, one with the five and a half percent increase granted the last 52 years, that was the number, but we don't know what the future holds, or maybe it'll continue to go up. Maybe it won't. Again, they're cutting teak eight to ten times faster than they're replanting it. So one would imagine that that prices would continue to go up. But so when we look at our our business plan and our projections, which are in the business plan, you're certainly welcome to request those. Please do. Uh, I've got an email address here in a minute. Um, uh, we do them both with the five and a half percent increase annually and without. Um, so teenage teak, medium quality, five and a half percent. You know, the, the investment uh, uh, is, is stellar. But these are numbers without. And, and if you look at these numbers and you say to yourself, yeah, I, I, I like these numbers. These numbers work for me. I invest $6,880 and I get $94,000 back in 25 years without the 5.5% increase. Like if Teak goes up in value at all, like it, it's just even better than that, right? And so, uh, you know, that, that, that's really the thing. We, we look at the numbers without the increase. You can look at them with and without in our business plan. We encourage you to do that. Uh, 2000, the initial growth, um, you know, starting to grow by 2007, the trees are, uh, pretty big, right? Just let's say eight years, uh, getting big, the dry season, they drop their leaves, which is a, a great thing. They are deciduous. So the dry season, they drop their leaves. Uh, we take people out to visit the farm all the time, 2013, 2016, you can see the trees really getting some size at this point, long, tall, straight trunks which is what you want when you want to turn trees into lumber, long, tall, straight logs. Uh, and then this was a visit to our teenage teak plantation shortly after we bought it. Uh, some folks having fun there checking out their trees. And then 2023, just last year at the uh, mature tree plantation, it's hot, humid, which is what the trees love. And, and there we are taking some measurements. And I always like to tell the story of, you know, people will think you're crazy. And and they really will, by the way. If you if you get off this webinar, you decide you want to own you know own parcel of teak or or whatever, uh, and you tell some people about it, they're they're, they're really going to think you're nuts. Like what? You, you bought teak in Panama? And it's 25 years, and yeah, yeah, you you, you did. And you know this is the uh, I think the video Hi, play. Mike Cobb in Panama at our teak plantation. This is our mature plantation planted 23 years ago in the Darien province. Uh, I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, teak plantation that once was a cattle pasture like this deforestation. And, and uh, you know what, it's wonderful to be able to come in and, and plant thousands and thousands of teak trees and turn a cattle pasture back into forest. Uh, it's also a very lucrative investment and it's sustainable. You harvest in 25 years, you replant. Your children get the next harvest. 25 years later, there's another harvest. That's for your great grandchildren and so on and so on. Please. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Find out how you can take deforested farmland and turn it into beautiful forests and create generational wealth for your families for centuries in the future. Yeah, and and you know it, it really is a it, it is something about centuries into the future, right? You, that last one is you know build the legacy, right? But but very simply, you own the land and you own the trees, right? It, it's yours. You own it, right? Um, and when the harvest happens in 25 years, the trees will be cut, they'll be processed, and you'll get a very, very nice return. Uh, and then the property will be replanted. And uh, it's de minimis. Like if we had to replant uh, the parcel today, 
it'd be about three, 400 bucks. So again, it, the, the replanting is very, very inexpensive. And then in 25 years after that, you know, the next generation uh, will get the harvest and you know, replant. And, and this is really something that will be a legacy uh, for, for, for centuries to come. Uh, if we think like the family offices, if we think like the ultra rich, if we think like the endowments, university endowments, right? They think long, long term. And, and this is just simply a way to do that as well. Uh, best time to plant a tree was, you know, 20 years ago, but the, the next best time really is, you know, right now. Um, there's, there's something we don't know that'll happen, but I always point it out as track record. The other thing I would like to point out in terms of track record is teak has been plantation raised for about 350 years, starting in India, what is now, uh, was Burma, now is Myanmar, um, and then throughout Laos, Cambodia, and down into uh, Thailand, you know, and Indonesia. Uh, th this is where teak was grown in plantations for over 350 years. So the, the growing of teak in plantation has an extremely long track record, you know, three and a half centuries. Uh, and then the price of teak over the last 52 years uh, doing, doing great things as well. I don't see that changing very much. Again, today we're cutting it down and, and uh, you know, milling it about eight to 10 times faster than it's being replanted. So this really will continue, I believe, uh, to create more shortage, more demand in the marketplace. And we know what that does for, for prices. Uh, leave a legacy. That, that's one reason to do it. You know, if you got, if you got you know, a few thousand dollars laying around, you don't know what to do for Christmas for a kid or a grandkid, you know, get them some teak. You know, they might scratch their head and go, what the heck? You know, grandpa, grandma, what would you do that for? But in 25 years, you know, that they'll be really, really glad that you did. Uh, it is about tangible assets. It's about the diversification into a hard asset as our governments are spending more and more and inflation's, you know, going up, even though they say it's not. We, I think we all, we all kind of know better than that. Um, so hard assets, uh, you can own the teak inside a, an IRA, a self-directed IRA. Uh, we do take crypto. We do take metals. If you have gold, silver, if you have crypto, anything that's in a Coinbase wallet, um, we will accept that as payment for the teak. We we view that as a swapping of hard assets. We have one hard asset, you have another, we'll take it and make an exchange. Um, and then if you're interested in residency, that plan B, right? This, this is a way to, to, to get that plan B residency uh, for many folks as well. Uh, here is the email address. We're going to segue in a moment to the sawmill presentation, which will take about uh, about eight or nine minutes. Um, but info at teakhardwoods.com. If you'd like to see information about the teak itself, the plantation, uh, the residencies, the plan B, uh, we have all that information. It's in a, a couple different documents. Just send us a note. We'll be happy to send over all the information about how you can become an owner of teak. Uh, plantation parcels. Uh, if you're interested in the residency, we have that as a separate document as well. So, all right, let's talk about near-term cash flow, right? I, I think you know, 25 years gets a lot of people scratching their head. I hope I hope you're scratching your your chin, thinking that's a really good idea, right? I mean, it's it's it's, it's uh, certainly something that the uber wealthy and the family offices have been doing for 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 hundreds of years. Um, you know, uh, but near-term cash flow is important too, right? And the sawmill is the opportunity to capitalize on something in a much shorter time frame, uh, five to say seven years. And we're going to look at that in a minute. The uh, uh, the 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 uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'll get, let Ryan talk about it in a minute. Um, anyway, the sawmill equipment's pretty simple stuff. Uh, teak milling specifically is what we plan to do. There are a few other sawmills in Panama. Uh, that that uh, that mill many different types of trees. Uh, we will be the only sawmill in Panama exclusively milling teak, uh, and what that means is, is our equipment will be slightly specialized, but the output will be much more productive. Uh, thinner saw blades, you know, produce less waste. Um, there are lots of things like that that become really really important. Um, it also has to do with how you cut the lumber. Maybe Ryan, if you'll make a note and talk about that. Uh, uh, when we when we uh, get to the end, I think that's an interesting thing as well. So you know, you're not just cutting the log like like you would like the diesomatic on an onion, right? You, you're using intelligence to uh, to get the best possible grain and things like that. Um, so this is the process, the equipment we put it through kilns. So kiln drying is very important. 
Uh, again, not something that is done very often in Panama, uh, not a huge export of lumber and what we call first stage finished product. Uh, the first stage, I mean, teaks obviously comes out as lumber. It can be used in, in things like furniture, boats. Um, the uh, semi-finished product, which is where we will produce most of our uh, residual uh, product is in lumber and squares. Uh, squares really for beams, but lumber in the best dimensionality that produces the highest rate of return uh, for the sawmill. And then finished products. Uh, you know, some of the products we get down to the tiny little pieces, uh, they can be bonded together to produce things like, you know, cutting boards or, or other products. This will be a very small percentage. You'll see this in a, in a minute in the percentage as I like to point it out. But the one product that's a really cool and efficient use of the lumber is flooring, in this case, flooring panels, because literally what you see there on the left are flooring panels made out of teak. It's basically lumber that's just been finished one more level, right? It's just a, a, a nicer finish, a finer sanding, a little bit more rounding on the corners, but that's it. So it's really just lumber that's one more step towards a finished product, but now it is a finished product. And teak floor panels are insanely expensive uh, and our ability to produce them uh, at the sawmill and the and the factory next to it are are tremendous. And so this is a product that we will be uh, producing in mass. And then there's the leftover. What do you do with the sawdust? Right, there'll be a lot of sawdust and and grindings and things like that. So uh, possibly wood chips for fuel. Um, but really, what Ryan has identified is the market for. Uh, composite blocks where you can either mix it with uh, gluing materials or you can mix it with cementaceous materials. Uh, and they will be used generally in the local market as a replacement for cinder blocks and other uh, other types of products like that. So even the waste product will be uh, turned into something usable in the local marketplace to capture a return from those as well. And then uh, there are some innovative products that have to do with the cellulose component. Uh, antique cellulose has some interesting qualities because of the oil content. Uh, so there are some innovative products that we're going to continue to look at as well for uh, some of the waste products. Uh, let's see here. So um, this chart, there's a lot here. By the way, we have a business plan that has it all in it. You can look at it at your own pace, your own leisure. Uh, and I encourage you to do that if you're thinking about a sawmill investment. Um, but wholesale board price uh, for uh, the different various sizes uh, and the various types of products versus retail. Um, and some of, some of it will be going out retail, a small percentage will go out retail, a lot of it will go out wholesale. Um, but you can see just generally uh, you know, the, the prices of this product on a uh, wholesale and retail basis. Um, but there you'll see on the left side, the quantity of marine lumber, it's worth the most, but only 5% of the teak will really qualify as marine lumber. Uh, FSC, Forestry Stewardship Council, that's the certification to say we are renewable, we are sustainable. That lets us move product into the big US and Canadian uh, marketplace, the big stores. Uh, and then the finished products, the cutting boards, 1%. Again, it's a tiny little percent, but the margins are huge. Uh, and about 40%, 39% in those floor tiles. Again, trying to capitalize on a finished product that's really not much more than lumber, uh, but has a huge demand in the marketplace. So these are the kinds of returns on, on the sale of product over the, pick, uh, the period of five years. Uh, the investment proposal is pretty simple. You know, we like to keep things really, really simple. Uh, we've got Three investment levels, 50,000, 100,000, and 2 million. Uh, a $50,000 investment returns 1.75 times your money. We anticipate it being over a five year period. You invest 50,000, you get back 87.5, you put 37 in your pocket. 100 turns into 200, and 200 turns into 500. So, slightly better return uh, with the larger investment segments. That's your fixed return. But you also end up with a carried interest in the project, a contractual carried interest in the project. And, and so those returns stack on top of your fixed return. Uh, and so, uh, again, you can see the numbers here, but let me just use the 100,000 because it's in one example. Uh, the, the carried return will produce another $59,000. 
And so when you take those two together, what you end up with is over a five to seven year period. We don't know exactly, but but the projections show it should be five years. Um, you end up with $259,000, which is about a 23% ROI. Uh, that's, that's strong and it's immediate cash flow. And the really cool thing is after year five, starting in year six, seven, eight, nine, 19, and 29, as long as that sawmill is in business, you will continue to get your percentage returns from that sawmill over the long term. Uh, you will become uh, a, a contractually uh, obligated investor in this business. And there's a reason I say contractually obligated investor as opposed to shareholder. There's some specific reasons, and I'm not really going to go into that tonight, uh, but I will go into that one-on-one -on -one with anybody who takes a look at the business plan and, and is serious about investing. Um it, ha it has to do with the operational functionality of the business and reporting and things like that. It's, it's, it's a very technical answer, but it's an important one. Anyway, but the project, the sawmill project itself will produce a very, very nice return for investors. Uh, again, there's a business plan. Please take a look at it. Uh, see if it's something that you want to explore further. Uh, either uh, sawmill or teak, you can send the same email address, info at teakhardwoods.com. And uh, we'll get you a business plan on either, both. And uh, I think that's it. Ryan, let me bring you back on here and uh, uh, and just uh, say that you, I think you have some really, really good information or, you know, some good news for us, some good information and some great news. What What is that, Ryan? Well, uh, we've been, uh, I'm assuming that it's the, the news that happened yesterday. There's all sorts of news going on, but um, yesterday- hey, by the way, uh, sh share bunches, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, um, yeah, yesterday, um, um, I, we were, we were pushing to find the right location for our mill. Mike briefly discussed where it needed to be. Uh, there were some recent developments that made it more challenging for us to find uh, reasonably priced properties in that area. Um, and uh, so we spent a lot of time boots on the ground, finding the right property. And then we had an interesting time negotiating negotiating the right price. And yesterday we sat down with the vendor that we had of the property that we had located, negotiated a really good price, fair fair for us and fair for them and great for us. And we signed that uh, that deal yesterday, made the deposit, and proceeding to uh, to register that property in the company's name, and uh, which closes the door to kind of a a bit of a um, um, what will be a great story, a number of great stories to tell in coming years and open the door to, uh, to the, I guess, the really acceleration of us towards the, um, of our, of our steps towards the, uh, the realization of the project. So it's, uh, it's really exciting, really yeah. exciting. Yeah. It was, and, and by the way, will you please send Alyssa some pictures? I know you took some pictures of the signing yesterday, but also a few pictures of the property that, that we've acquired. Uh, send those to Alyssa and in the follow-up email, she'll make sure to put those out to folks. I think it's, it's really cool to, 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 to see that and have folks be able to see that with us. So Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm heading down to that area tomorrow. And okay. uh, so I'll be able to get some fresh pictures of the property now that it clearly has changed a whole lot now that it's ours. <laughs> um, and when it then it was uh -huh. then when it wasn't ours yesterday, yeah. Yeah, so uh, right. so I'll take some some pictures of that and uh, and send a pictures of the signing of that contract uh, so uh, so you can share with who uh, tremendous who, who you feel is and, is good yeah yeah and you, you mentioned the acceleration I think one of the things that that's important for folks to understand is when you sign the permissive event of the promise to sell and you fulfill the obligation which means pay pay the you know pay the amount you've agreed to pay. That property is legally yours, even though the title can take years in some cases, two, three uh, years to transfer. Um, you, you own the property at that point. The title processing going through the government channels and all that kind of stuff, that's just that's a formality, but but you're the owner. Absolutely. And because yeah. we're the owner of the property, as soon as we wire the money, which we're gonna do here, uh, well, I think we wired the deposit yesterday, didn't we? Deposit deposit has been received. So everything right. is now Great. ours. We just have to yep. uh, to make sure that we we finalize the uh, the payment within the time frame, and then there's no issue Absolutely. with uh, but it. Yeah. But in the meantime, you can go ahead and order the equipment, which you have uh, on reservation. You can begin to look at uh, building the site itself, doing the site prep, getting our sawmill uh, uh, buildings erected, things like that. So uh, maybe talk about that just for a minute too, because you use the word acceleration, and I think that's really where we are. Things are going to accelerate very, very quickly now. 
Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, that I'm excited about is we've been at, we actually were positioned to buy a property about four months ago. Is that does that yep. sound about right, Mike? Yeah, sounds about um, right. And yeah, about four months ago, we were positioned to buy a property, and that didn't that didn't work out the way we'd hoped it would. Um, but uh, it put us in a position where that time we were pushing ahead, um, getting all of the legal structure in place to be able to move ahead with the construction of the mill. Um, the 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 Darien province um, is in a lot of ways um, very unique in, in the way that business has to be done there. And in order to do it properly and not find yourself in, in issues that are otherwise avoidable, um, you have to make sure your ducks are in the row. And so the last four months, we were able to get all of those ducks in the row, leaving that one variable missing of what the property is. And mm -hmm. where that property exactly is we knew where it was going to be we just had to find it and so we've been able to make inroads with the appropriate authorities tomorrow yep. i'm actually heading down with the um this would be the equivalent of a ministry of environment official to yep. finalize the, vi the very last steps of what's called an environment uh, environmental impact assessment right which typically takes about four months to be completed um okay. it's going to take us uh, a matter of weeks because we've been able to get all of the preliminaries done um, so that all of the, the essentials of the project are understood by the appropriate ministries. And now all we have to do is let them know where it's happening. And right. and so we'll be able to move forward very quickly with that. Um, and, in and by the way, relation that's a I mean, that's a testament to you. I mean, you, you know, we talk about leadership on the ECI level, but, you know, you are the leadership here and your ability to really understand how we could run parallel on a lot of things while we were looking for the property, while we were evaluating it from a, you know, a, a, a mechanical standpoint, operational standpoint, but also from the legal standpoint, like you were able to continue to work the various ministries with the types of permits that we need uh, in parallel. And, and, and that's tremendous, Ryan, that, that that's why we are where we are today. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. That's a, yeah. a big compliment. Hey, uh, that is, I to let, oh, I want to yeah. let Alyssa ask uh, some, I see some questions have come in. I think I can see a, a red dot there, but anyway, um, before we get to the questions, uh, I, I, I alluded to something, maybe you could just, just mention it uh, about how, how we're going to intelligently cut the logs into lumber. Uh, I, I, I probably butchered the explanation. Yeah, no, but... I actually noticed that comment and it was, <laughs> it was a great segue in nothing butchered, butchered about it. Okay. Um, what, All right. <laughs> one of the things that Mike mentioned that I think is a very important point. Um, currently, the teak that is produced in in Panama, um, in very large part, is not milled here at all. Um, right. It's purchased and and shipped overseas to where Mike was saying that the teak plantations have existed for 350 years. Also, in the areas where a lot of illicit illegal logging has been going on, has been being limited. Those mills are looking for wood. Um, they and, are the and by only... the way, just you said you said most, but isn't it like ninety nine percent of all the teak grown in Panama? Yeah, there's a yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's probably more than that. Um, there's very few <laughs> mills yeah, that uh, right. that actually deal with teak because teak is a very per peculiar wood to deal with, in the sense that the way it has to be cut is very specific to teak um, because of the various attributes of the wood, including the sap and the heart, uh, the heart wood. They they right. they have different qualities that fetch different prices in the markets. And if you include those elements in with other elements, it can increase or decrease the value of the wood. Yep. Um, here in Panama, there's a lot of other logging, uh, 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 sorry, sawmills that typically specialize in uh, Central American tropical hardwoods, um, which are a lot more forgiving um, in the way that they can be sawn. And most of them are, are, are sawn what's called straight cut, where they just put the log on the mill and just cut it. How did you describe that, Mike? As a, oh, like a diseomatic. I was like the diseomatic. Yeah, they just cut no, it. Yeah. They just cut it in straight straight lines. Yeah. Um, which for some of the more stable woods that they deal with here in Panama, that works just fine. However, for teak, in order to get those beautiful straight um, grain lines that we're familiar with looking at in furniture, in in hardwood flooring, in marine grade, particularly marine grade um, um, teak. The wood has to be cut. There's two ways you can cut it. Um, one is quarter sawn, where you're effectively looking for those points where the wood is cut at 45 degrees to that grain. Um, and rift cut, which is where you're effectively cutting it like you would a, a fan blade. So you get a perfectly straight cut across those, uh, those grains. And in order to do that, you have to have your sawmill 
tuned to be able to efficiently do that. Um, there are mills in Asia that are doing that to some degree, um, but they're not doing a very good job of it because they're high volume output mills. We are a artisanal mill is what I like to call it. When people are asking what we're doing here, I say that we're doing an artisanal mill. And we cut the wood, we're, in, our, we're set up to be able to cut the wood according to what our buyers are looking for. And our buyers yes. are high are high end buyers, lower volume buyers, but high end buyers who will pivot according to what the market demands of them. And we're in a position with our equipment that we can pivot in response to what they're asking of us. And that's really the, the core of the market that we're looking to, to capture. Um, because of the 18,000 shipping containers of teak that leaves Darien every year, um, we're probably going to occupy maybe 50, 50 to 100. Yeah, that's, that's less than 1% for sure. I can't that's do right. my head. But that's right. That's right. We'll, we'll be occupying realistically 50 to 100 yeah. containers um, yeah. and, and in, by the, way, in the those... initial point. And those eighteen thousand containers are are logs. I mean, that's not that's not that's right. sawn teak. That's just logs they put in a container and ship to India, where they do all the processing, right? So, that's right. That's right. absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Again, there there really is no processing going on here in uh, in in Panama. Right. Now, when I say fifty to hundred containers, that's what we're set up to be able to handle comfortably. We can expand significantly, um, right. depending on where we find our market um, penetration, where we can grow from there. The numbers that that Mike showed with you earlier are based upon those numbers. Now the expansion, we can do that, um, but we don't wanna be presenting numbers that uh, we haven't been able to prove ourselves capable of yet. Um, and and so we're when we look at that, we realize first of all, we're gonna be changing the way the wood flows to some degree, even if it's only 50 to 100 containers. Um, as we expand, that might change to 125, to 200, to 300 containers. Um, at which point we would be in a position to expand the mill operations to make it 500 containers, 800 containers, and, and so forth. Still a tiny percentage of still of a tiny percentage, and we have we at least in the discussions that we're having now and the market analysis, we really want to be producing the highest possible value product for the lowest possible investment, um, so that we can turn the teak plantation investors um, into people who are interested in investing in the mill as, as so that they can, in, in a, I don't know if I'm, I'm saying this incorrectly, so they can double dip on their, on their process. So, so They're making money off the, the mill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some people have already, right? Some people have, right. Right. Yeah. And All so right, they well, can get, make, the, we'll yeah. go ahead. Sorry. I'll let you finish and then we'll get to. A yeah, list. I think, I think yeah. I'm done with that. Um, but yeah, right. that's, that's really what we're looking to do is to cut that wood in a way that, just takes a little bit more time to do and a little bit more um, care so right. that we can produce that higher value. Yep. All right. Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Ryan. Hi, gentlemen. You definitely had some great comments, um, Ryan, and thank you for sharing that, that that insight. I feel like that was really crucial to understanding the, the sawmill and the projects and what's going to be happening there. We did have some great questions that came in. Let's start with titling and the options for titling. So obviously there was two different opportunities that were presented as far as yep. actually purchasing the teak, as far as the land, and then buying into the limited partnership of the sawmill. So can you share a little bit about opportunities for titling? Can it be in an IRA? Can it be in a family trust? Is there limitations with either of the opportunities with what we can do there with titling? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. And what I would rather do, I'm gonna give a very general answer that's, that's okay, but in order to get a specific answer to your specific situation, I would ask that you engage by email. One of our property consultants will get back to you and be able to answer any question specifically and technically. Um, Panama allows pretty much any entity with the exception of an IRA custodian to uh, hold the title. You can put it in your own name. You can put it in a company. Um, we do talk about self-directed IRA ownership uh, because what you end up doing is your self-directed IRA creates an LLC, say in Florida, for example, and that Florida LLC then becomes the owner of the Teak parcel. Uh, so th there is a way to skin that cat, um, but you can own it in your own name, joint name, uh, uh, you know, corporation, trust. Um, so you've got a lot of different ways that you could hold title to the property. Um, but again, bring that question up specifically and we'll make sure uh, in an email, we'll make sure we, we get a, a specific answer to your case. 
Yeah, Mike, in the business plan also you've referenced, or you referenced the business plan also for the sawmill. There is yeah. a business plan also for the teak if you're interested in investing in that. Mike showed a couple charts, just so everybody's aware, that start with the returns for the carried returns and the fixed returns. Those are all in the business plan as well. So if you'd like a copy of the business plan, there's an email address that's right here on the screen. Shoot us an email there and let us know. You'll see the return timetables, and especially with the sawmill, it lays out the return that we're expecting for each and every year based on the projections that Ryan and Mike were mentioning. So if that's one of your specific questions you wanted more information on, request the information of the documentation and we will send that over to you. Ryan, Ryan did a tremendous job of working with our finance folks to put together uh, very easy to understand tables, uh, but with a lot of the back information there in other tables that are not as easy to read, but they contain the you know, more of the raw data, so to speak. So the business plan has both uh, and it's in great detail. And, and it is something that if you're interested in looking at the Salmo investment, you should absolutely uh, uh, look, look at the business plan and take a, take a read through on that. And Mike, you mentioned um, the opportunity for residency and different types of visas, but you also mentioned, just briefly touched on what that looks like as far as being um, a U.S. individual and U.S. taxes and kind of the implications of that and where it folds in with the business plan for the sawmill. So can you just touch a little yeah. bit on... I, I I'll just make a very, I just make, I'll make a very simple statement. If you're a U.S. citizen, you're taxed on your worldwide income, no matter how you own it. You can own it. Well, an IRA, it, it's tax deferred, right? But anyway, but if you own it in a company, you own it in a trust, you own it in your name, you own it in whatever, you are taxed on your worldwide income, and there's no way around that legally. Illegally, you can do whatever you want, but legally, you owe taxes on your worldwide income. Other countries aren't set up that way. Uh, you know, a, a lot of countries are based on residency. So again, that's a very specific question. Nobody at our end uh, will, will answer any specific questions on that. Um, you need to consult with your local tax advisor, whether it's a lawyer, a CPA, an accountant, find out what the tax rules are. Uh, in both cases, the, I can just make this statement, in both cases, sawmill antique uh, uh, production returns, those are Panama source income. So that's the question you should go back to your accountant with. Hey, uh, you know, if I do this investment, I'm going to end up with Panama source income. Uh, how will that be treated, you know, tax wise in, in my home country? Great. Thank you, Mike. Also, do you need to be an accredited investor to do either of these opportunities? Um, the sawmill, the answer is yes, absolutely. You do. Uh, the teak parcels, um, you, you own the land, you own the trees. Uh, so no, you do not. Great. Is there going to be other opportunities for people to invest in the sawmill? And is there limited options for who can invest this time or how many investors we can take? Um, well, we're raising $2 million. And I think, uh, Alyssa, you just said we had about 1.3-ish um, funded at this point. So we've got another you know, six, 700 uh, open in this offering. I don't anticipate any additional offering in the sawmill. Um, we've we've slightly overfunded the investment because things will go wrong. I mean, no offense, Ryan, but but your guys are probably going to blow up a, a saw or two. I don't know what they're going to do. But anyway, I mean, like so we've overfunded a little bit because we're going to make mistakes. We're going to break some equipment. We're going to spend the next 18 months learning how to operate a sawmill efficiently and effectively um, before we take on our first major harvest. Um, but uh, so there's another whatever to call it, 650, 700,000 uh, open and and that's it. Then then the sawmill investment will will close. Great. So you you made reference to the fact that we have the saw we have teak itself in Panama and we have teak in Nicaragua. Obviously, right. you know you didn't share a little bit about this in the beginning, but I do know that this is really a culmination of something that you guys envisioned as the primary investors when the plantations even started in the first place. So we are now at that, that process where we're able yeah. to harvest and create the sawmill. Is there an idea then that the, the teak in Nicaragua will also be transported to Panama to be processed by the sawmill, or is there a no. plan for the sawmill well, in Nicaragua well, also? I, I think it. I think it. You know, whatever. I think our oldest teak there now is maybe six years old. I don't know, five, six, seven years old, something like that. So in another twenty years or or eighteen years, whatever it is, a couple years before maturity, um, I, I think we'll do the same thing again. We'll uh, uh, we we probably have the property at our Grand Pacifica location, so we'll just allocate you know, whatever, a couple hex for, for a sawmill. 
um, and and we'll, we'll we'll start to harvest the teak we have there. Um, but there are other people growing teak uh, now along the coastline of mostly on the Pacific coast of Nicaragua. So our ability to get that wood and do the same thing there would be similar. But that's that's whatever 15, 18 years into the future. Great, thank you. Well, we do want to honor everybody's time and we're coming up on the hour. So we just wanted to say thank you so much for being in attendance today. You will get a recording of today's session. And obviously, like we said, if you would like to request a business plan for either the teak itself or for the sawmill, please email us at the info at teak hardwoods that you see on your screen here. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, thank Alyssa. You, Thanks, thank Ryan. You, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very right. much. Bye everybody.